Go out to the dead. Survive us from the Copyright 2019. W.G. Sweet. All rights foreign and domestic. Reserved in their entirety. Legal. This is a work of fiction. Any names, characters, places, or incidents depicted are products of the author's imagination. Any resemblance to actual living persons, places, situations, or events is purely coincidental. Before the Plagues, Somewhere in the World, Overclocking, SS V2765. Stay down next to the friggin' bank, Hunter, Beaker yelled. Beaker could see that Hunter probably wouldn't be hanging around for much longer. He didn't have the wits that Simpson had had, and a firefight was no place to have to babysit. Why was it that he always ended up with all the idiots anyway? They had been pinned down in this particular position, a sandy beachhead, for four days. Sand and water in front of them, mountain and jungle behind them. They were on the other side of a river, and if the man upstairs, the man that pulled all the strings, Beaker liked to think, didn't do something damn soon, they might not see five. The fire was just as heavy as it had been on the first day, non-stop, round after round of machine gun fire and mortar rounds that came so fast it was hard to tell when one ended and another began. Hunter crawled over, eating some dirt as he came, but at least he had crawled. The idiot had walked the first few times like he was out on a damn Sunday stroll. Sergeant Beaker, he whisper yelled, over the sound of gunfire. Shouldn't we maybe take the stuff now, sir? Hey, screw you. If I say we lay low, we lay low. We take it like we're supposed to. No deviations on my watch. Now, shut up and crawl your white ass back over to your position, mister. Now. The stuff was V2765. The thing was, Hunter had already had it at least once. The rest of them hadn't and never would. But Hunter had come with the vial clearly marked as a booster shot. He didn't need that yet. Hunter went. He didn't have to be told twice. Beaker was one mean son of a bitch, and he had absolutely no desire to mess with him. Even so, this whole situation didn't set well in his mind. And that was mainly due to the fact that it didn't make any sense. And how in hell could it? He asked himself. There was no answer because there could be no answer at all. Fifteen days ago, he had been safe and sound in... in... it wouldn't come. Someplace. He had been someplace. Not here. And he had been... Uh, whatever he had been, or wherever he had been, it just wouldn't come. He could almost remember, like it was right there, just beyond memories. He could remember waking up here with Beaker, Phillips, and Ronson in the middle of, of, where am I, he asked himself, but he didn't know that either, and they weren't disposed to tell him. Other than waking up in the middle of this firefight, he could remember nothing. He made the outside perimeter, curled up into a near ball as he pressed himself into the dirt embankment. Jungle all around. Not the Middle East, then, where he had been. Had he been in the Middle East? Fighting, fighting, uh, he couldn't make the information come to him, but it seemed as though it was just barely out of reach like all the rest of it. Blue chip, volunteer, for thoughts floating around in his head. They had given him a shot, some sort of a booster. Yes, a booster, a booster shot. For what, he asked himself, but he had no idea. About time, Beaker yelled over the roar of gunfire. They had been pinned down for the last several hours with heavy fire. It had finally begun to fall off somewhat, and it was time to make a move. Beaker was no fool. He had every intention of getting his men the hell out, including that test case they had laid on him. He had already lost four good men on this mission. He couldn't see losing any more. He looked across the short, smoky distance, 
directly into Ronson's eyes and signaled left, away from the sand, towards the jungle that pressed in from behind them. A quick sideways flick of his own eyes told him that Hunter and Phillips had caught it too. Beaker signaled Ronson out first, then Phillips, and then Hunter. It was a slow go, belly crawl for the first few hundred yards. The bullets continued to wind above them, but they all made it in one piece. Two hundred yards in, they were able to stand, the jungle finally offering some protection. Beaker led the way out quickly, but carefully, through the lush greenery. The others fell in behind him silently. Two miles further through the dense jungle, and they finally lost the distant sounds of gunfire, and the jungle fell nearly silent. They fell silent themselves, moving as quietly as they could from tree to tree, aware of the noises that surrounded them. A short while later, when the gunfire had completely fallen off, the jungle seemed to come back to life. Bird calls and the ever-present monkey chatter. That was a good sign to Beaker. If the jungle was full of soldiers, the birds sure wouldn't be singing. They pushed on through the night, and morning found them in a small village with a main trail running through the middle of it. They walked quietly through the village end to end, burned out, empty, but a good place to rest up. Oh man, Ronson complained, crazy. Beaker agreed wearily. He was leaned back against the side of a burned-out hut, smoking a cigarette he'd pulled from inside his jacket. Hunter didn't have the slightest idea of where they were, let alone what they were talking about. Beaker had led them through the jungle, and at first light they had come upon this village. They had crept in warily, ready for whatever lay before them. But there had been no need. It was empty. A couple of dozen scattered bodies, busy gathering flies, burned out huts. The design wasn't familiar to him. He had thought Beaker would move on. He hadn't. They were still here. But where was here? And how had Beaker found it? It eluded Hunter. Sure did. Thought we was done, Phillips agreed. Yeah, well, we made it this far, Ronson said. He grinned, and then the grin turned into a full-fledged smile, and he began to laugh. Phillips joined him, and a second later, when Hunter was sure Beaker was going to open his mouth and tell him all to shut up, he started laughing too. Oh, it's good. Look at him, Ronson said, holding his side and pointing at Hunter. He don't have a clue. That seemed to drive all of them into hysteria, Hunter saw, including Beaker, who was usually hard-nosed and moody. He was doubled over too, holding his sides, tears squirting from his eyes. Is that true? Beaker asked at last, once he managed to get the laughter somewhat under control. Is that your friggin' problem, is it, Hunter? You don't have a clue? He stopped laughing abruptly, and within seconds, Ronson and Phillips chuckled to a stop. Do you have the slightest idea where your ass is? Beaker asked seriously. No. Well, a jungle, I guess, Hunter answered. No. Well, it could be a jungle, I guess. Ronson mimicked in a high falsetto. Is it? Hunter ventured in an ear whisper. Look, Beaker waited for silence. Take a break. It's going to get worse. Why don't you have a smoke and kick back? Enjoy the break. Yeah, well, the thing is that I don't smoke. It's bad for your lungs. I'm pretty careful about my health. Really? Beaker asked politely. He chuckled briefly, lit another of his own smokes, and then spoke softly. I would like your complete attention, Hunter. Do I have it? Yeah, sure, I... He cut him off, his voice a roar. In case you hadn't noticed, there's a war going on. A war, Hunter. You understand that? You ain't gonna live much longer anyway. Get with the program, mister, now. Hunter's eyes bugged out, but as Beaker finished, he forced himself to speak. I know that. I can see that. It don't mean I have to die, though. Not necessarily. Man, Beak, don't waste your time. He's hopeless. Same old thing, like Simpson. Like all those guys before Simpson, Ronson said. Beaker drew a deep breath, winked at Ronson, and then spoke. Yes, it does, Beaker said calmly. It does because you ain't a regular. 
You ain't been here long enough, and you don't mean anything to anybody. And that sucks, but that's life, Hunter. He paused and looked over at Ronson. How long was the last one? Fourteen days, am I right? As rain, Ronson replied coolly. And where are we now? Beaker asked. Seventeen, Phillips asked. Uh-huh. Eighteen, man, remember? Uh-uh, Ronson corrected. Eighteen, man, remember? Simpson bought it eighteen days ago, and this asshole came into play. Replacement, supposedly. Right, Beaker said, it is eighteen. And that's why nobody cares about you, Hunter. Eighteen's too far. You'll be done at twenty. It never goes past that. And I'll bet bullets to bodies you'll buy the farm long before we're done with eighteen. See? No, Hunter said slowly. I don't see. Seventeen, eighteen? What the hell was all that about, he wondered. Bronson chuckled. I think he's confused again, Beak. I think he was born confused, Phillips added. Seventeen, eighteen, Hunter asked aloud. He didn't get it. Not completely, anyway. Have a cigarette, Beaker told him. I told you I don't. Yeah, right. Screw that noise. There's a pack inside your jacket. Check it. See if I'm right. Hunter fumbled with the jacket snaps and finally pulled the jacket open. A half pack of smokes resided in the inside pocket, a silver zippo tucked in beside them. He looked up with amazement. So, Beaker asked, smiling widely. One of you guys stuck them in there while I was sleeping. Has to be, Hunter said. And when was that? Hunter thought about it. He looked over at Beaker. Beaker just smiled. Don't you get it yet, Hunter? Don't you feel like a, an extra in a play? Blue chip? Volunteer for SSV2765? Wow. They must have zonked your brain, man. Look, it was hard for Simpson, too, and he was with us for 20 days, and you know what? I like that sucker. He was all right for a white dude. All you guys show up combat ready, except you're all messed up in the head. No idea what to expect or even where you are. It ain't supposed to be that way, so we always have to lay it out for you. You're one of them. Super soldiers. We call it overclocked. You're going to get dead, and you know what? Then you're going to come back. Don't ask me what the hell is in that stuff they give you. All I know is you'll get dead and then you'll come back from it and they'll ship you out. That booster shot? It ain't exactly a booster shot. I don't know what exactly it is, but once you're gone, I know this. It'll bring you back. Yeah, back. In the beginning, some didn't come back. It don't matter, though, because they come and got them, too. But the last several months, they all of you, come back. Dead, and then you're not. And then they're here, and you're gone. And then in a few days, some other waste of space shows up in a supply drop. What? A supply drop? Hunter asked. Oh yeah, supply drop. Wrapped up like a, like a douche, man. Uh-uh, Beak, man. That line was really revved up like a douche, Ronson said. Okay, bad analogy. I hate that song anyway. I always did. But you guys come wrapped up like a package, man. We unwrap you, and you're alive. You're not moving or anything, but you're alive. We leave you be for a little while, and next thing you know, you're sitting up. And pretty soon, you're walking and talking. Yeah, boy. Really freaky stuff, Philip said. Mucho freaky. Hunter swallowed hard, lit up one of the smokes from his jacket, and leaned back against the side of the hut. The silence held. So, Beaker finished quietly, you got to deal with it, man. You just got to. It won't be long. Stateside, Project Blue Chip, Complex C, Patient Ward. Test subject, Clayton Hunter. Compound SS-V2765. Gabe Colson moved away from the monitors. Heart rate's dropping, don't you think? He stopped as the monitor began to chime softly. Before he could get fully turned around, the chiming turned into a strident alarm that rose and fell. Damn it, Colson said as he finished his turn. What is it? David Johns wheeled his chair across the short space of the control room. 
His outstretched hands caught him at the countertop and slowed him at Colson's monitor. Flatlined, Colson said, as he pushed the button on the wall to confirm what the doctors one level up already knew. Clayton Hunter was dead. I see it, Dr. Ed Adams replied over the ceiling speakers. The staff called him Dr. Christmas for his long white beard and oversized belly. Bertie and I are on the way. A lot of good that will do, Johns muttered. Colson turned to him. Go on in. Do CPR if you want. They don't pay me enough to do it. I don't know what that stuff is, but look at the way the doc suits up. Clayton Hunter will be in rigor mortis before anyone gets in there at all. No argument, John said. He wheeled back to his own monitor, called up an incident sheet, and began to type. Me too, Colson agreed. Preserve the video, med, monitor data. He punched a few buttons on his console, and an interface for the medical equipment came up. He saved the last 48 hours of data, and then began to fill out his own incident report. These reports might never be seen by more than one person. Maybe two if you counted the person that wrote it, Colson thought. But it would always be there, classified, top secret for the next hundred years or so. And he wondered about that too. Would it even be released after a long period of time? He doubted it. The stuff they were doing here was bad. Shit you didn't ever want the American public to know about. He had made his delivery a few weeks before. Whatever that stuff was, bad people had not only come to know about it, but had come to have a need for what it did. It didn't matter to him, not really. There were rumors, a few things he had seen while monitoring test subjects, nothing he considered concrete. Maybe it extended life. That was the strongest rumor. From what he had seen, though, as far as test subjects, it did its fair share of ending life pretty effectively, too. So when a few guys had asked him to smuggle out a sample for a large amount of cash, he had done it. And here was another failure to add to the growing number of failures, if that's what they were. This incident report, along with the one Johns was doing, would probably get buried deep under some program listing that no one would ever suspect to look into. Or maybe it would get burned right along with Clayton Hunter's body. He glanced up at the clock and then went back to typing. Uh, call it 4.32 p.m., he asked. Works for me, Johns agreed. I got 94 for the body, Johns said. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's a fast drop, but we both got the same thing. 94 it is. No heart, no respiratory, dead as dog crap. Dog crap, Johns agreed. They both fell silent as they typed. A few moments later, the doors to the observation room chimed. The air purifiers kicked on with a high-pitched whine, and they could both feel the air as it dragged past them and into the air ducts. The entire volume would be replaced and the room depressurized and then repressurized before the doors would open. And that would only happen after the air was tested and retested. A good 20 minutes away before anyone would step foot into the room with Clayton Hunter. Later. Complex C, Autopsy Room. Ed Adams and Roberta Summers had dissected Clayton Hunter's body methodically. The autopsy had been painstaking. It had to be. It was recorded in detail and some general somewhere, hell, maybe even the president, would be looking that video over in the next few days. Maybe even watching live now, Ed Adams thought. They had the capability. There was nothing to see, though. He had suffered a major heart attack. The heart had a defect. No history. One of those things that just came along and messed up your $2 billion research project all at once. Coronary thrombosis, he spoke in a measured voice, appears to be after the fact. The artery looks mildly occluded. The myocardial infarction appears to be caused from a congenital defect, specifically an atrial septal defect. Bertie? I concur. Easily overlooked. The lack of sustenance put a higher demand on the subject's heart. The defect became a major player at that point. Bad luck for us. 
Uh, bad luck for Clayton Hunter, Ed Adams added. Oh, of course, uh, bad luck for the subject, Clayton Hunter. I simply meant bad luck for a research volunteer to be defective in such a way that in effect it would compromise a project of this magnitude so badly. She turned her eyes up to one of the cameras she knew to be there. This in no way paints a true picture of V2765. We should proceed. Unsatisfying as these circumstances might be, we should proceed with subjects 1120F and 119X, same compound. She turned back to the corpse on the table. You want me to do the brain biopsy, she asked Ed. Ed frowned as he made eye contact with her. They had decided, at least he had thought they had decided, not to mention brain biopsies. Three times now he had discussed the importance of not focusing on the changes that B2765 made to the brain. Anything that altered the brain could alter financing, funding, lab time. Even the government didn't like changes to brain matter. Are you thinking there could have been an embolism, he asked. Well, I... She sputtered away for a second before Ed rescued her. I think all we would see is evidence of the embolism that occurred near his heart. We could search out areas of the body and most likely find more than one occurrence of embolism. Well thought, Bertie. But I believe we will take a look at the brain later in the week. Right now, I want to focus on the enzymes, proteins, blood work, and readying the other two for a conclusion of this trial. Yes, uh, I agree entirely, Dr. Adams. You have your samples? Yes, of course, Dr. Rex? Ed frowned hard and shrugged his shoulders in the direction of the thick glass. He lowered his voice to a whisper. None in here. That was stupid, Bertie. What was that? Colson asked Johns in the control room. What? Johns asked. That whisper, I guess, Colson said. Oh, that. You know these two got it bad for each other, probably making little remarks they don't want us to hear. Besides which, you make a report on that and we all have to deal with it. Them, sure. But us too because the bosses will be pissed off about it. Best to let that stuff slide. If the boss wants to know, he will. He looks at all this stuff in depth. Colson looked about to say more when Dr. Christmas began talking once more in the autopsy room. Let's close them up, Ed Adams said. He stepped on a switch set into the floor, paused, and then spoke again. Lower the air temperature in here. We intend to keep him a few hours while we attend to other parts of the autopsy. No one in here for any reason. Out in the control room, Johns keyed his mic button. Will do. How low, Doc? I guess about 34 Fahrenheit will do it, just to slow it all down for a while. Done, Johns agreed. He adjusted a temperature graphic on a nearby monitor via his mouse. Colson leaned over across a short distance. So we got to look at that stuff for a while? Great. They're going to sew them up, so it won't be so bad. Yeah, that's like I got a mild case of flu. It's still going to suck because every time I look anywhere, I'm going to feel compelled to look at it. Yeah, me too. It's there. Draws you to it, like the bunny on the Playboy cover. You look at the rest of the magazine, but you know you're going to end up looking at her. She's the reason you bought the magazine, after all. Colson nodded and smiled. And I'd rather look at Miss January than a dead guy with big stitches across his belly and over his chest, sewing him back up again. That is some ugly stuff. Johns laughed. But you look anyway. Human nature. Why do you think people slow down and look at accidents? Because we're morbid, Colson agreed. Well, that too. But it is that fascination with death we have. Look, he pointed at the monitor. You think Clayton Hunter knew he'd be laying on a steel slab the afternoon with Dr. Christmas shoving his guts back in and stitching him up with his nursey assisting? They both laughed and turned away. She ain't half... A scream cut off the conversation, and both men turned back to the monitor. Clayton Hunter was sitting up on the steel table, arms drooping at his side, mouth yawning. Dr. Christmas had backed away until he met the wall behind him. Nurse Bertie was nowhere to be seen. What the hell? What the hell? Get a camera on the floor. Maybe she fainted, Colson said. 
Got it, Johns agreed. He stabbed at the keys on his keyboard, and a view of the table at an angle appeared. Nurse Bertie's leg could be seen, angled away from the table, skirt hiked high. The camera paused briefly, and then the view began to shift as Johns manipulated the camera angle. Her face came into view, mouth open, blood seeping from one corner. Doctor, Colson called over the speaker system. Outside the airlocks had clicked on, and the air was cycling. Good, he thought. In 20 minutes, the cavalry would be here. Dr. Adams. The doctor finally took his eyes off Clayton Hunter and turned towards one of the cameras. On the table, Clayton Hunter leaned forward and tumbled off the edge of the table. At the same instant, the air purifier quit cycling and three armed men in gas masks stepped into the airlock. Jesus, John sputtered into his headset microphone. You guys can't do that stuff. That air has to be worked. Three more men stepped through the lock and the door to the autopsy room opened as well as the door to the control room. A split second later, the rifles in their hands began to roar. The sound was louder than Colson expected in the enclosed space. He clasped his hands over his ears, but it did little good. The soldiers, he saw, were wearing ear protection of some sort, noise-canceling headgear. The remaining three soldiers had stepped into the control room. He saw as he looked back from the floor, they had their rifles leveled at them. The others were still firing within the confines of the small autopsy room. A small gray cloud was creeping along the floor and rolling slowly into the control room. The stench of gunpowder was strong in the enclosed space. The air purifiers were off. Colson knew there was another control room outside this control room that controlled this space, and possibly even another outside of that space. Built-in redundant protection. It was clear that they were in a very bad place. Colson saw Clayton Hunter lurch to his feet and stumble into the soldiers who were firing at point-blank range in the tight confines. A series of bullets finally tore across his chest and then into his head, and he fell from view. A second later, the firing dropped off and then stopped completely. Johns was listening to the sound of his own heart hammering for a space of seconds before he figured out it was his own. The smell of gunpowder was nauseating, and he suddenly lunged forward and vomited on his shoes. As he was lifting his head, he saw that the soldiers were retreating back through the airlocks and into the outer spaces of the compound. Jesus, Colson managed before he also bent forward and vomited. They heard the air filtering kick back on as both of them rolled away from the puddles of vomit and quickly disappearing low gray vapor from the gunfire. The doors in the autopsy room suddenly banged shut and then their own door whispered closed as well. Once again, they were isolated in their small space. They both sat silent for a moment, and then Colson left and returned from the small bathroom with a mop and a bucket from the utility closet. He left again and returned with a bottle of disinfectant, sprayed down the vomit, and then the balance of the small room. That isn't going to do anything, John said solemnly. We're infected. Whatever they infected that guy Hunter with, well, we got it now. Colson ignored him, waited the ten minutes for the disinfectant to work, and then cleaned up the mess. Neither spoke while he returned the equipment to the small closet, and then came back and sat down. You heard me, right, man? I heard you, Colson admitted. I just don't give a damn. It's too fresh. I can't believe it right now. He looked at the clock. Man, I was off duty in twenty minutes. Twenty minutes! He spun and looked at John's but Johns was looking up at the monitor that was still on in the autopsy room. The smoke was being drawn out by the air exchange, and the horror of the room was slowly coming into focus. Dr. Adams lay sprawled in one corner, a line of bullet holes stitched across his back. The back portion of his skull was missing. Jagged bone and gray-black hair clumped wildly around the fractured bones. Johns gagged and looked away. Jesus, they killed everybody, Colson said as he continued to watch. Nurse Bertie lay where she had fallen, only her legs visible in the shot they could see. 
Clayton Hunter lay against the end of the stainless slab, his head a shapeless mass, the stitches across his chest and stomach bulging. Colson finally turned away too. They're coming back for us, man, John said. Colson spun to the door. Not now, stupid ass, but you can't think we get to live after that. They contaminated our air. We're dead. No way are we not dead. Colson said nothing. Later. It was six hours before the soldiers came. They had finally taken a better look at the room. John's moving the camera around as Colson watched. Dave, tell me I'm wrong, but that dude came back to life, right? He was unsure even as he said it. John shrugged. Uh, I don't know. I think what happened is they missed something. We missed something. Maybe a lead came off, you know? And the lead came off, and so he seemed dead, but he wasn't really dead at all. Not really. He was still alive, just that that lead was off. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the alternative is that he came back to life. You don't think that, do you? I mean, do you? Because that's crazy, Gabe. Crazy. No. No, I, I can see what you mean. I can see where that could be. But I've heard rumors. Uh, same as we all have, Johns agreed. But come on, that's crazy. The airlock cycled on, and six soldiers stepped into the hall-like space that was actually just an airlock between the control room, the autopsy room, the former patient ward, and the outside world. Johns tensed, waiting for the door to their space to cycle on. But it didn't. The soldiers were dressed head to toe in army drab green plastic coveralls, respirators, big units set on their backs, and a full face shield and breathing apparatus covered their faces, somehow joined into the coveralls. Tape was wound around the elastic cuffs of the legs and the plastic boot covers that joined there. Flexible olive green gloves covered their hands, also taped where they slipped under the plastic coveralls. None of them ever looked their way at all. They just waited for the airlock to cycle and then stepped into the autopsy room. A second later, the monitors in the autopsy room went dead. Oh man, David John said, that is not good at all. Colson got up and left the room. A minute later, he was back with two Diet Colas. He handed one to David Johns and then sat back down. Johns glanced down into the cola. The top was already open. He looked at Colson, and Colson stared back, unblinking. They kept the supply of the virus compounds they were testing in there, but the med supplies cabinet was also in that closet. They had talked it over once. They had decided that. He pushed it away and focused on the low whisper of the air exchange. You think they will outright kill us? Colson asked after a few long minutes of silence. Gabe, I think they will, Gabe, John said after a hesitation. He tried to stop himself, but he glanced down at the cola in his hand. It was half full. White powder floated on the surface, clumped and drifting like tiny icebergs across the cola sea. Probably. No. Listen, man, they're listening right now, I'm sure. Listening to see where our minds are at. As soon as those flunkies in there are finished with that job, They'll be in here to finish up the cleanup. He swallowed hard. Yeah, I guess that's how I see it too, Colson agreed. He raised his can and tapped aside. Been good knowing you, Dave. John stared him down for a few minutes and then sighed. Yeah, same here. He raised the can in the salute and then downed it. Colson followed suit. Silence descended on the control room. About the author. I was born in New York. I wrote my first fiction at age 17. I drove a taxi and worked as a carpenter for most of my life. I began working on the internet in 1989 in HTML, graphics, website design. I spent time living on the streets in Rochester as a young teen and as an addict. I also spent time in prison. I was honorably discharged from the U.S. Navy in 1974. I'm a musician, I write my own music as well as lyrics, and I'm an artist. I've written more than 20 books in the Earth Survivor series 
and several George stories. If you would like to keep up to date on the series, please hit the subscribe button and notifications. Thanks for joining in. See you next week.